quite a bit. And you don't make a cake unless you what? Stir it. It has to be, the ingredients have to come together. If they're separated, it tastes awful. You get a little flour over here, you taste the baking powder, you taste the salt, you taste the sugar, but all separated, it's not a good taste. So I want to tell you today, I want to stir you up. And I want to stir the gifts that are within you. I want to fan the flame of the gifts that God has placed within you. So, we've been talking about the gifts. Last week, Dean John Trannell, who's our Dean of Families, he and his wife are away today, but they are amazing elders in our church. He spoke on the gifts, and it was wonderful, wasn't it, last week? We're going to continue. Jesus gave us gifts to equip the body of Christ. Now look at us in here. We're a microcosm of the body of Christ. The body of Christ are those who have decided to be followers of Jesus Christ, right? How many of you have looked at the church in the last few years and said there's something wrong with the church? Raise your hand. You can be, you can be truthful. We all know that there are things that have not been operating well and have not been functional and have not been like Jesus in the church. And I believe the church has been telling us, get out of your walls. Get out of the borders that you place on yourself. You're not an institution of man. Because if you're an institution of man, man's going to do things. I don't want man to do things in the church. I want God to orchestrate what we do, right? So we have to operate in his gifts. First of all, there's been a di disappearance of the spiritual gifts. Uh-huh, everybody looks around, well, my church wouldn't do what you did today. Right? Yay! We're marching around with flags? People in my church would say, you're crazy. Well, I don't think so. I think that if the Holy Spirit gets us moving and marching, he's firing us up, he's filling us up, and he's getting us ready to go out and to do some powerful things. I think that when we sit and we have to be afraid of man, afraid of what somebody's going to think, then we're in trouble. Because Jesus didn't give us a spirit of fear. What did he give us? Love. Say it louder. Love. Power. Love. Love. A sound, disciplined mind. I'm telling you, God wants to change what we're doing in the church. There's been a disappearance of the spiritual gifts since the time of Constantine. Actually, before that, the early church were powerful. They were moving from house to house. They were praying together. They were eating together. They were sharing together. Thousands would get saved at one time as when Peter preached at Pentecost. We saw the church was growing. The church was doing what Jesus had told them to do. They were doing miracles, signs and wonders, healings. They were setting the captives free and they were casting out demons. Now, here we are since the time of Constantine saying, that the church, the Christian church, is the official church. We went downhill from there. We've seen lethargy come in. We've seen uh, people almost going to sleep, actually going to sleep in the church. The church has been asleep. And you know what? There's been lukewarmness. But Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Who likes lukewarm water? You either want it hot or you want it cold. You don't want it lukewarm, do you? Well, Jesus said we either are hot or we're cold. I actually want to be hot for Jesus. I want to be on fire with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And so we have to think about the job of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And what is it? It's to equip the saints. Are you saints? Everybody says, I don't think I'm saints. I don't act like a saint. I don't look like a saint. Well, we are saints if we're followers of Jesus Christ. Did you know that when Mom Lindsay and Gordon Lindsay bought the old defunct nightclub, which is where the cafeteria was, did you all know that that's how we started? This school started in a nightclub. Well, it wasn't still a nightclub. It had been a nightclub. And every night when they closed down, the band played when the saints go marching in. And isn't it awesome that one day the saints came marching in? Yes. And they still march over there to the cafeteria building every day. Isn't it prophetic that God said, I'm going to take this land, I'm going to take this used-to-be nightclub, and I'm going to make it a place of the study of the Word of God and feeding the saints. I love it. 
See, Mom Lindsay was on fire. As a matter of fact, in Germany, one of our Bible schools over there was built where Hitler trained his troops. I mean, Mom Lindsay was not afraid of the people who had been in the place before because she was going to take that territory. All of this land here didn't belong to Christ for the nations at first. It was uh, achieved by prayer. Much, much prayer. Jericho marches, right? There were Jericho marches around the places that, that were the next apartment buildings to be added or the next place where a building would be uh, constructed because there was a fire in Mom Lindsay and that was to establish this Bible school, to establish it in the nations, to bring Jesus to the nations of the world. Where's your fire? Look at yourself. Are you burning brightly? Are you barely burning? Are you burning? Do you have the fire of the Holy Spirit in you? You have to stir it up. You don't let it go. You know, uh, when I went to, to um, <laughs> the Methodist Church years ago, I played the piano since I was seven years old. And the first time I played was on a Wednesday night for prayer meeting. They didn't have anybody to play that night, so my papa asked me if I'd play. I said, yes, sir. I'd been working on what a friend we have in Jesus. So I played with them as they sang, and I didn't know B flat at that time. I just started taking piano. So I played, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, it's very bad without the B flat. And I was, I was mortified because I had, at that time I had good hearing. That's before I worked 17 years in the music department. And what happened was I was mortified because I missed all the B flats. But do you know they asked me to come back? I've been playing ever since. I haven't stopped, seven years old. And I started. So I used to sit in the church and they'd sing, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. And I go, help! I don't want to be here, Lord. It was terrible. And what they were talking about, the words of Jesus, they are beautiful. They're wonderful. They're words of life. But we get so churchified that we start singing like that, we start looking like that, we start acting like that, and we don't touch the world. So are we on fire? Yes or no? Yes. All right, so if we're on fire, the job of the pastors, the teachers, the job of the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists is to equip each saint. And what does equipping mean? It means a recovered wholeness, like you broke your arm, you have to set it and it mends. Susan's going, uh-huh, I know about that. She had some broken places in her spine. And she knows what it's like to go through the mending. But when you mend it, it gets whole. And that's the job of the pastors and the teachers, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, is to make the body whole, to bring wholeness to you. The second thing is to discover a function when a physical member is properly operating. Did you know it's the job of all those guys in the five-fold ministry? All of us who have some leadership position like that are to help you to find your place to operate and to function in the body of Christ. Isn't that good? Are we doing it? That's what we're working on right now. Helping you to see where your function is, what is your gift, and what are you supposed to be doing. The work of the ministry is the business of each member of the body of Christ. And it's not the exclusive job of certain leaders. In other words, who's supposed to be a minister? Come on, all of us. Come on. And I know when my dad was a pastor, everybody thought, well, Brother Judge needs to do the visitation because he's the pastor. No. We're all supposed to visit. You see, we all have been called to be ministers of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Bringing people to Jesus and then bringing people to each other. That's fun. I like that. That's a good call. And it's your call. It's your call. It's everybody's call. So we have a call, each one of us, in the ministry. Now, when I lived in Phoenix for a few years, I went to Tommy Barnett's church. And Tommy was telling us about how his church is constructed. I love it. He said, this is where the handicapped people sit. He said, this is where the people sit who are coming out of drug addiction. He said, this is where the people who are coming out of AIDS sit. He's going, everybody's got a little place because 
the members of the church take a bus and they go out and pick people up. Have you thought about that? They don't just sit in the seat and say, well, I'll see you next Sunday. They're out during the week, during the work of the Father. They're out finding other people, bringing them to salvation, bringing them to healing. And they would bring their people on the bus and fill up this huge church called First Assembly in Phoenix, Arizona. I was impressed, highly impressed. And then I started hearing about the Dream Center in Los Angeles. I was impressed again because Tommy Barnett spoke to a minister's conference that I was attending. And he actually told us how they would have a, a place, they had bought a hospital and they had a place for the guys coming out from the gangs. They had a place for the guys getting out of drug addiction. They'd go pick up the ladies on the street who were in prostitution. They had a van, they said, uh, they'd give them a flower and they'd say, we'll be back at, at 10 o'clock tonight. And if you want to have a change in life, we will help you to, to study, to take classes. We'll help you to grow, to have uh, a job and the thing that God would have you to do in your life. And then at 10 o'clock, they'd come and see if those ladies would join them. And the ladies would say, well, my pimp's going to kill me. I can't do it. And Tommy Barnett said, don't worry about it. He said, they told him, we got the gang members right down the uh, in the next building, they'll take care of you. <laughs> They're gang members who have been restored, right? Can you imagine all of these in that one place called the Dream Center in Los Angeles? Why? Because one person can't do it. It's not about one person. It's about all of us. We are the church. We are the body. Now, I know you love your little finger. Anybody love your little finger? I know I've smashed my little finger before, and it hurt, didn't it, Mackenzie? I had a lot of pain. And since I played the piano, it really was a lot of pain because you still have to try to play with that, that pinky sticking out over there. And you know, you, you think, well, a pinky's not that important, but it is important. If one of us gets sick, we should all cry with them. We should all bring comfort to them. If one of us does well, we should rejoice with them. That's what the scriptures say. Because it's about us being a body. And each one of us are members of that body and we're joined together. That's where we're under the head. And who's the head? Jesus Christ. So when we're sensitive to him and we listen to him, we can flow together as a body. Okay, I need five people up here. Quick, quick, run, run. One, two, three. Look at you. Come on, Gail. Come on. That's it. Brianna. <laughs> okay, she says move a little bit. Which way do you want us to move? That way? You're good. You're good. Okay. I got three. I need two more. You Thank you, sir. I need one more. Okay, Mitchell, come on. Now, I'm going to say that these are all members of the body. You can be the arms or you can be the legs or the toes, whatever you want to. But you have to walk together. Okay? This is your assignment. Find a way that you can all walk together. Go. Uh, you all have to decide. You're the body. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, you're the head, so you tell them which way to walk. To the right. He said, go to the right. Change the right. To the left. <laughs> just a little bit. Back, just a little bit. Stop. And? Move it to the front. Forward. Look at that. Did they do good or what? <laughs> this is the body working together. We're all together. Now make a circle. Make a circle. Uh, backs together. 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 Uh -huh. <laughs> Now, you remember in that movie, you remember in the movie where uh, it was Gladiator and they were in the ring and you remember that the, uh, the king had said, okay, now we're sending the chariots in. And the chariots were gonna come at you guys. And they were coming with horses and they were coming toward you. Okay, uh, Pastor Matthew, Mr. Gary, if y'all come up, you're the chariots and the horses. Now, the general in Gladiator said, I know what to do. 
And because he knew what to do, he'd been a general. He said, hold your shields. And he told them how to hold them a certain way. So that when the chariots came and the horses, instead of them being crushed, the horses reared up and fell and the guys fell out of the chariot. You might have to take a prep fall. <laughs> so move over this way a little bit. Can you get them in your, your camera? Okay, here come the chariots and the horses and you all are going to, okay, you guys are going to deflect them. Ready? Tell them what you do, deflect. All right, as one, say it. As one, as one, as one. Okay. Look at that. Look at these guys. Thank you. Thank you to each one of our actors up here. We're going to put you on salary. We're going to make a movie. I, I do have a couple of movies in my hat. So let me tell you what. When we work together as one, notice their backs were together. Because the back is the weakest place, right? So if we can keep our backs to one another, then we can protect one another. And we can fight. Okay. So we have... As I'm talking to you, we are the body of Christ. And so I want to say to you that God is calling us to work as one and to unite our different gifts and abilities. It's going to give us love for one another, and we're going to have unity in the body of Christ. A church that's divided will fall. A family that's divided will fall. So we need unity, and we need love, and we need to, to work together. Our gifts should mature us. They should help us to become stable. And this will keep us from deception. Now I'm going to read a scripture to you. If you would look at Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16. Ephesians 4. This is talking about the different gifts in the body of Christ, our spiritual gifts. And these are given to us by Jesus. Okay, But to each one of us, in verse 7, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, I'll read it from the, the um, screen there. It's a little bit different. This NIV, and I like NIV. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. In other words, as he handed it out. But to each one of us, grace... That was the last verse. Okay, verse 8, please. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Ephesians 4, 8. You see, I, I wrote a play called The Jewish Wedding. I don't know if any of you saw it, did you, Mary? And it was one of my very, very best productions, I think, that we've ever had. It, it was heavenly because it was talking about the bride, that's you, us together, and Yeshua or who is he? Jesus, the bridegroom. And so you see the relationship, and you see it when the bride is just this little girl with a dirty dress, you know, and she's like, ah, and she's all about herself, and Jesus is trying to say, listen, I've asked you to be my bride. I'm paying the biggest price you can imagine. It's my life, it's my blood. And she's like, oh, but Jesus, da, 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 da. You know, she's still thinking about herself. We do that in the church. And then a little bit later, she begins to realize he's paying a dowry for her. He's giving himself. He's giving his life. But she, then she realizes how dirty she looks and how pitiful she is and how many mistakes she makes. And she says, but how can you love me? How can you love me? And he says, I see you as my father sees you. Isn't that cool? He doesn't say, well, you stupid, filthy thing. Now, we've had people do that to us, right? You've had people do that, but that's not God's way. He said, I see you as my father sees you. My father says, you're my child. He says, I'm going to bring you to myself, and as I bring you to myself as my bride, I'm going to make you clean. I'm going to make you beautiful. And you're going to represent me to the world. Isn't that gorgeous? So this is the first part in the first scene. And then we go on. And Jesus is crucified. I show that on the stage behind a screen. And you get to see the red lights and all the beating. And then Jesus is crucified. Then he is uh, put in the tomb. And then he's resurrected. We're glad you all came today. We bless you in Jesus' name. And he's resurrected. 
And he tells her that he's got to go away. And now can you imagine the bride has gotten close to him and loves him and wants to be with him. And he says, but I must go away. And she says, but what am I going to do here without you? How can I live in this world without you? And he says, I'm sending a comforter to you. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you, he'll guide you, he'll teach you. And so she waits, and in comes the Holy Spirit in another scene. He brings all these boxes. i got about nine big boxes, and he brings all the boxes and puts them down. And, of course, she's still, ah, she's so excited because she's going to have gifts. Oh, I love gifts. Do you like gifts? Yeah. Tom did a gift one Christmas where I had to go around. I found a big box, and then I had to get the clue out of the big box and go find the next size box, and then get the clue out of that and go find the next size box. That's kind of fun. But Jesus gave us Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit gave us these gifts. So she's now opening the gifts, and she's going, oh, for me. And he says, yes, you're going to prophesy. Prophesy, I'm going to be able to prophesy. He says, yes, you're going to speak my words to people. And she goes, but how can I do that? I'm going to make a mistake. He says, I'm going to give you Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's going to show you how to speak. So all of this goes on, but we see that Jesus has relationship with us, his bride, his body. And he can't be with us in person, so he gave us Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit then gave us his gifts, right? The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that Jesus is preparing us to be able to do what he wants us to do on this earth, and that's to do what he did. To do even more than he did, he said that we would do even more because he's given us each other and he's given us, uh, we have a lot of more time to do what we're doing in his name. So I was on verse eight. Let's go to verse nine. Now he ascended. And what does that mean? Except he also descended to the lower earthly regions. That's the ninth verse. 10. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And then 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And then verse 12. For the equipping, to equip his, his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, what did he give us these fivefold ministry gifts for? To equip the body of Christ and to build us up. Now, why is he building us up? Let's go to the next verse, 13. Until we all reach unity. Everybody say unity. Unity, unity in the faith. We must come together as one and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, he's going to give us these gifts, the fivefold ministry, so that we can mature in his word, stop just drinking the milk of the word, but eat the meat of the word. Get a revelation of him, and then begin to be able to attain to his measure, which means look like him. Right. How are people going to know you're representing Jesus if you look like the world? Right. If you act like the world? If you talk like the world? How are they going to know we're representing Jesus? We are to be mature, built up like him to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Next verse, please, 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. You see, these gifts are to mature us, they're to help us to become stable, and to keep us from deception and the evil schemes of the devil and of people. How many of you are a bit worried about the things that are happening in our nation at this time. I know. But you know what? We are to be able to say no to the deception, see the deception, recognize it, and then we are to, to be able to pray against it and then stand up and speak the truth. Right? Amen. That's the mature Christian. Amen. The mature Christian isn't going to just wham wham about all the bad things happening. The mature Christian is going to get on their face and pray Fast and pray. The mature Christian then is going to stand 
And now if you look on Facebook, boy, you see people just fighting on Facebook. Have you seen that? Sometimes they just, I've got my opinion, you've got your opinion, yeah, and they're back and forth. But what are we supposed to be doing? We can only speak the truth. Amen. The truth of God. And then we won't be falling into the deception. Then we're coming against the deception by saying God's truth. Yeah. Then we will no longer be infants, babies, whining, complaining, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by the wind of teaching, by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Are there people scheming? Yes. Oh yeah. Do you want to be a socialist nation? No. Do you want to be a communist nation? No. Then we've got to stand up and we've got to say, I see Amen. what this is. And I say no in Jesus' name. Amen. And I believe that we have to begin to, in love, speak the truth to one another. Then we can grow up into Jesus Christ. We can work effectively and we can see the body grow. Go to the next verse, please. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Wow. Then, the next verse, please. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Next verse. We're going through 16. Okay, I think we did it. So, I wanted to tell you very quickly that the church should function as the eyes, the ears, the hands, the feet of Jesus. 1 John 4, 17. He gave the Holy Spirit to assist us to be evangelists. And I believe that God wants more evangelism now than we've ever seen before. So, our church is going to be going into the apartments around here and into the neighborhood to visit. We're also going to be getting a truck or a bus, and we're going to make it so that part of the side goes down like a stage. And we're going to have ministry for children and youth. We're going to show up on Saturdays and Tuesdays, and we're going to sing and give scriptures and give out snacks and pray for kids and begin to meet families. And as we do, God's going to help us to evangelize. Now, some of you are gifted for evangelism. How many of you are, you have a gift for winning people to Jesus? Okay. We need to be using that. I, I need to start getting you guys, and we just need to start praying evangelism. And then we need to get all the rest of you guys. If you can sing a song, if you can tell a story, if you can act, we can figure out how we're going to do it to make the gospel message clear. Because we're all called to do that. And it takes every one of us. And then let the little evangelists go out in the crowd and start praying for the people. But I really believe that everybody should lead somebody to Jesus. I'm going to ask, have you ever led somebody to Jesus? I believe we should stir that up. We just learned the Roman road. We learned however it is that God gives you to be able to speak. And by the way, every time I evangelize, I don't say the same thing. Some people just do the very same thing every time the the four spiritual laws, or the Roman road. But I operate in a gift of the word of knowledge. So guess what? The word of knowledge helps me. I can look at a person and all of a sudden the stuff starts coming. This is what you went through when you were a child. You're dealing with that, da 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 And then people go, okay, you know, God really does have my number. God cares. And then they're willing to pray. Whatever your gifting is, God will use it in your being able to share the gospel. Some lady told me one time, well, I don't have any gifts. There's nothing I can do. I said, well, can you make an apple pie? She said, well, I sure can. I said, make an apple pie and invite your neighbors over, and we can all come and we can pray together, right? Because it's not that hard. One of my guys on one of the mission trips, we were in Australia, and he was going to give the altar call. He says, Miss Rihanna, I don't know how to give the altar call. I handed him a, a little track. I said, read this. It had the whole thing. It had the sinner's prayer. It had the whole, whole apologetics. I said, just read this. Now get up there and do it. Because it's not that difficult. 
we need to ask God, what is my gifting? How can I share the gospel most effectively? And then we need to start doing it. And that's what I want our church to do because we're going to win people. Remember Tommy Barnett had the people over there and the people over there and the people. I want to do that in Christ in the Nation's church. I want each one of you to go out and bring a bunch of people. And we get them saved, and the next thing they know, they're in Nikki's discipleship class. Wait, Nikki. He's got a good discipleship class on Thursday night. And the next thing you know, we're going to have an overcomers class because that's for the people who are dealing with addictions. And there are many, many addictions that people deal with, right? And it's hard to stay clean and sober, but you got to do it to walk in the Lord, right? We can help them. So we go from one step to the next step to grow people up. That's what the church is about, is to bring us into that maturity, to bring us into the fullness of Jesus Christ. I want us to get excited about who we're going to reach for Jesus. The little kids, the teenagers, the families, they're all important. David Green back there goes with me. We go to Mesa Ridge. He knows these people, let me tell you. Wait, David. He knows the people. We go from apartment to apartment, and he remembers. Now, Miss Rihanna, this is where we went over there, and this is what, who we prayed for. And you know what? It's important. He has a pastoral gift. He loves people. It's beautiful. You are going to stir your gifts, whatever they are, whether it's evangelistic or we're going to even do some deliverance because there are some people who need to go beyond just say salvation. We need to get set free. And there are people who know that you're gifted to set the captives free. We're stirring these gifts. God is giving us a gift of miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to start praying for people to be healed and see them healed. You're going to say, well, I don't know if they'll get healed when I pray, but I'm going to do it anyway. Then you walk up to them and you just do what God told you to do. Sometimes God will tell me, just pray for their back. So I put my hand on their back. And if I put my hand on their back, he'll start saying, there's something wrong with the vertebra. And actually, one lady I prayed for at Dr. Seif's church several years ago said, I just got an adjustment. Just put my hand on her back and went all the way down. I said, well, that was God. It wasn't me. I only did what he told me to do. If you'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, listen to him. He will tell you what to do. And you will see miracles. We're going to see miracles, signs, wonders, healings. There's a story of a crusade where there were 10,000 Muslims who came together. Now, you know the Muslims don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, right? They say he's just a prophet. And they don't believe that he rose from the dead and that he's alive now. Well, the evangelist at this crusade asked them, he said, if Jesus Christ heals you all and, and does it right here today in the midst of you, he said, would you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if, if you saw the miracles, and they, they said yes. So he began to pray. They began to pray. Miracles started happening. People were healed. And do you know that these Muslim people began to shout out that Jesus is alive. Jesus is the Son of God. The signs and wonders and miracles are needed for evangelism, right? we know that in many, many places you can work, you work year after year after year trying to bring the, the souls in. But when you say Jesus is alive, I believe in healing, I believe in miracles, and they begin to see them in their midst, people have to know and proclaim that he is Jesus, the Son of God. And their, their lives get changed. The gifts of the Spirit edify us. You know what? They build us up. You are a gift. Did you know you're a gift? Look at the person next to you and say, you're a gift. You're a beautiful gift. You know what? Did anybody tell you that you're beautiful lately? Look at the person next to you and say, you're a beautiful or you're a handsome gift. That's right. I like that. We need to tell each other more often, you're a gift. Is Miss Renee a gift? When she gets filled with the Holy Spirit and singing up there, heaven comes down and glory fills my soul. I want to tell you, she's a gift. You're a gift. Thank you, Belinda, for sharing that word today. 
That's a gift. We need you in the body of Christ. We need each other. So how am I going to receive the gifts of the Spirit? Number one, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we were doing today, getting more of the Holy Spirit, being filled not just a little bit, not just halfway, but all the way, so that we're covered, we're immersed with the, the Spirit of God. Now, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, I want you to come down at the end of the service, and we want to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know that we get a measure of the Holy Spirit when we're saved, right? But if you really want to move deep in prophecy, if you really want to see signs, wonders, and miracles, you need to be filled, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, don't let it leak out tomorrow. You know, we go home, we put the TV on, we do whatever we do, and then the next thing you know, it starts leaking out. Now, I have to tell you all that even at Christ for the Nations, there's opportunities to lose the Holy Spirit. You have roommates sometimes that are not so nice. And sometimes if people would come to me when I worked in the music department. they say, I'm having trouble with my roommates. I said, well, have you had a meeting yet? No. But you know what we need to do? We need to ask God when we're in those hard, grating situations, what do I do, Lord? How can I continue to walk in the Holy Spirit? when this is difficult, right? And he'll show us how. Because he wants us filled constantly, staying filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you need to earnestly desire the best gifts. That doesn't mean, I want to be like uh, Cindy Jacobs. i got to be a prophet. No, that's not what we're saying. It doesn't mean, I, I remember people used to say, hey, I'm going to be another Joyce Meyer. You know? Everybody thought they could just be a teacher like Joyce Meyer, travel the circuit, go all over. Can we all be like that teacher? No. Can we all be like that great apostle that you admire? Or that great pastor that you admire? Or that great evangelist? No. There are certain people who are set in those positions. But you know what we are to be? People who take the gifts that God has given us. If we have the gift of prophecy, we need to prophesy. Every one of us. Not afraid to prophesy. And we need to use what God has given. So we need to, to realize God always fulfills his part. Man also has his responsibility. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. When Elisha wanted to get Elijah's mantle, what did he do? He stayed with Elijah. He wouldn't go away from Elijah. He knew he was a prophet. He knew he was called to be a prophet. But the thing he had to do to get the double anointing was to stay with his teacher. And that's what he did. And Elisha had 14 miracles. Elijah had seven miracles. I think Elisha's last miracle was when they threw a dead person in the, in the grave with him and that person came to life. <laughs> Can you imagine though? God gave him a double portion because he wanted and he stayed with that one who was his mentor, his authority, and the one he learned from. Isn't it beautiful to see? God says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. One of the best gifts that we can ask for is wisdom. We all need to ask for the gift of wisdom because it's used in every spiritual gift, having wisdom to know how to say. In Cindy Jacobs' book on hearing the voice of God, you know, Cindy started very young hearing from God. Her sister was my best friend until she passed away. And Cindy prophesied Lucy before she was ever born. She told her mother, you're going to have a little girl. And Cindy was like six, something young like that. And she had told her mother about the baby that her mother was expecting, that it was a girl. You remember Lucy? Yeah. Our dear friend. And do you know that this gift has been something that people didn't understand? They told her at first that, that uh, it was like a, a gift when you tell people's fortunes. People had said that to her. And then she finally realized that it was she, she had the prophetic anointing to be a prophet. But what happened was one night she was in a meeting and she tells this story in her book. And she noticed there was a woman, a young woman in the group. And she, in the spirit, discerned that the young woman was living with someone and they weren't married. And the thing was, in the spirit she got the message from God but she didn't have the wisdom at that time. It hadn't been built up to know that 
We don't talk about it. We don't say it in front of everybody. So she said it in front of everybody. And so guess what? The young woman got up and left. She didn't want Cindy to pray for her. She didn't want to have anything to do with her. You see, with any gift that we have, we have to have wisdom. Because there are times when your prophetic gift may show you some things, but it's not your place to say it. Your place is to pray it, to pray the answer. And then sometimes God releases us to share when the person is ready so that they can receive ministry. Now, remember, be dedicated to God also. You, as a person who has spiritual gifts, needs to live a holy life. People don't talk about holiness so much in America. We have really gone away from holiness. Now, I'm not talking about holiness where you have to have your hair down to here and you put in a bun and you have to always wear a skirt and where you always have to have certain things, no makeup. They used to call that holiness. That's not holiness. Holiness is right here. Put your hand on your heart. God, make me holy as you are holy. That's what we have to ask every day. God, make me holy. Help me to separate myself from the world and from the things that Satan puts in my way. And help me to know that I'm to be with you and I'm to be like you. It's your precious blood, Jesus, that gives us righteousness. But we have to make the decision to live a holy life. And we choose to do it so that the gifts that you've given us can be gloriously used. Did you know that you have in your hands the tools to damage Satan's kingdom? Look at your hands. You have the tools to damage Satan's kingdom. And you do this when you begin to use the gifts that God has given you his way. And when you live a holy life dedicated to God. Satan, though, doesn't want it. He targets us with his attacks. The more you want to knock the kingdom of, of Satan down, the more he tries to destroy you. But we say no. And the most steadfast, continual resistance to Satan on your part brings victory. Everybody say victory. And you're going to do that when you say no. You resist Satan. You resist Satan. You know who he is and you know what he's trying to do. Jesus fought a battle in the Garden of Gethsemane, but the victory was his. The victory was God's. He went to the cross. He gave his life. The three Hebrew children fought a battle. They weren't going to kneel to Nebuchadnezzar. What did they say? Even if we have to go in the fiery furnace, even if Jesus, even if you uh, come and you rescue us and save us, if you don't do it, we're still going to, we're still going to, obey God, and we're not going to bow before Nebuchadnezzar. There are ministry leaders who have lost those great gifts that were given to them, and it hurt us all in the body of Christ. It's very important for all of us to stay holy, to keep purity in our lives. The ministry gifts can be imparted by the laying on of hands, but we don't lay hands on hastily. Uh, when somebody comes up and you want to pray for them and you feel like you, they have a ministry gift, we need to know them first. We need to discern what their life is. When the Apostle Paul prayed for Timothy and he said that he had imparted the gift by the laying on of his hands, he already knew Timothy. He knew Timothy's family. He saw Timothy's heritage. And then he proclaimed what his spiritual gifting was. So we don't want to go hastily and say, oh, you've got this great gift. You've seen churches fall because they put somebody who was not mature, somebody not in the right frame of mind, somebody not living a holy life in a position, and it hurt the church and it hurt other people. So today, do you earnestly desire the best gifts? Do you desire to walk in the Holy Spirit? Do you desire to make a difference? Would you just stand to your feet? Father, I'm going to stir up the gifts right now. Father, I'm saying that those gifts, first of all, the fivefold gifts, we call them forth in Jesus' name, those who have been called to the fivefold ministry. And then, Father, we thank you for the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We, we stir them up in Jesus' name. 
the gift of prophecy, the gift of uh, word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. We thank you for the discerning of spirits, for the working of miracles, and for the healing works, Lord. We thank you for those. We thank you for the, the tongues and the interpretation of tongues. We thank you, Lord, for every one of the gifts that you've given us, Lord, that we stir them today in Jesus' name. And so today, Father, we thank you that we say yes to you, and we put ourselves in the position of listening to you, being sensitive to you, and walking in holiness and in purity so that you can work through us to advance the kingdom of God and to bring forth what you want to happen in this nation, in this world, in our school, in our church, in our community. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now I'm going to release you right here at the end, like Tom did during worship, that if you, want, you feel like you want to come up here for prayer, I'd like you to do that. And I'd like the elders to come up to pray. But if you want to just walk over to somebody and you have a, just a gift for them, a gift. It's a gift of a word of knowledge or a gift of a prophetic word or a gift of just blessing and exhortation. You may have a dollar for somebody. There's a giving gift that Nikki was talking about. I believe we're all called to be givers. But some people like Wayne Myers are givers. That's a gift. Millions of dollars have gone through this precious little man from Mississippi who's built and put uh, put roofs on churches in Mexico beyond anything you can imagine. But God has that gift for you. Do you want to just walk around and use it or you can come up here and, and pray? I'm going to ask Miss Burl to come on up. And uh, I think Nikki's gone. Miss Yvonne, would you come? Miss mm -hmm. Belinda, if you'll come, please. Thank you. All right. Okay, musicians, if you'll come up to the stage, please. We're going to let you give your gift. Thank you, Father. Can you try this to pour for us, Michelle? Okay. We just thank the Lord right now that we're, we're just ready to stir your gifts up, pray and prophesy over you. If you'd like to walk to somebody else and do that, and we're going to then say when you're, you're finished, we thank you for coming this morning. We bless you this week. First day is tomorrow. Opening rally is going to be awesome. And we just bless you as you begin your, your semester. We thank the Lord for keeping everyone safe and walking in health. In Jesus' name. So if you're ready to go, you can. If you want to minister to somebody, you can. Or if you want